DAY to Christians Part 1 There are two main sects of Christians, Catholics and Protestants, and three main heretical sects, Jehovah's Witness, Seventh-day Adventists, and Mormons. Catholics are the oldest, the earliest split was the Eastern Orthodox, Greek and Russian Orthodox churches have different organizational structure, but essential beliefs the same. Protestants split over Catholic hierarchy, Pope, bishops, etc., and saint worship. Martin Luther, 1483-1546, and Calvin, 1509-1564, lead a reform movement, which later became known as the Protestant movement. It rejected the accumulated rites, rituals and hierarchy of Roman Catholicism in an attempt to return to a purer form of Christianity. After a bitter struggle with church leaders leading to the excommunication of many reformers, a number of communities throughout Europe broke off and formed new churches in which Mary, the Mother of Jesus, was no longer worshipped, and intercession through saints was no longer sought. Priests were allowed to marry, and the infallibility of the authority of the Pope was totally rejected. Rites like communion, in which little pieces of bread were served to the congregation in the belief that the pieces were somehow transformed into the body of Jesus Christ, were dropped along with the use of Latin in church rites. Scriptural difference The Protestant Bible has seven less books than that of the Catholics. Mormons, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. 4.5 million followers with 30.000 missionaries gathering 200.000 converts yearly, 1980 figures. Founder, Joseph Smith, 1805-1844 killed. 1822 Angel Moroni Kane Book of Mormon published 1830. Smith's closest disciple, Brigham Young, 1801-1877, took followers to Utah and took 25 wives and promoted unrestricted polygamy until the USA government threatened to revoke statehood. Mr. Young received revelation that polygamy was abrogated. Unusual beliefs Adam actually God incarnated who came to Eden in Missouri with one of his heavenly wives, Eve. Had sexual relations with Mary to produce Jesus. God physically a huge man along with mother wife begat all human spirits. Until 1978 blacks could not enter the priesthood, age 14 males enter Aaronic priesthood and at age 20 they enter the higher office of Melchizedek. Thus all 17 temples of the sect were off limits to blacks. Then first president, Spencer Kimball got revelation to include blacks. Seventh-day Adventism William Miller, 1782-1849, calculated end of the world between the 21st of March 1843 and the 21st of March 1844, followers called Millerites. Samuel Snow later recalculates the date as October 22, 1844. After the Great Disappointment, remnants gather under Hiram Edson, Joseph Bates and Ellen White, 1827-1950. 1844 Christ entered heavenly sanctuary to judge sins of living and dead. Ellen White a true prophet. Sabbath seventh day, Saturday, no pork, alcohol or tobacco. Jehovah's Witness. 4.1 million followers, 200,000 converts yearly. Founder, Charles Taze Russell, 1852-1916, a former Millerite and Christadelphian rejected eternal punishment. Started Watchtower 1879, informal following in the millions, but organized only a distributorship of tracts, 100,000 books and 800,000 magazines printed daily. Followers called, Bible Students. Joseph F. Rutherford, 1869-1942, lawyer took over and officially named group Jehovah's Witnesses in 1931. Unusual Beliefs. Jesus not God, but Son of God and His first creation. Souls not separate from body. No hell tithing. World's End predicted in 1914, 1918, 1920, 1925, 1941, 1975. 6,000 year to the end of the world recalculated from Eve's creation whose date of creation unrevealed currently. The term Jehovah is not found in the Hebrew Bible, only in the Jehovah's Witness translation, the New World Bible. Jewish custom to avoid pronouncing the divine name led them to write Yahweh, Yahweh, in texts and read Adonai, the Lord. In ignorance, later the vowels of Adonai combined with the Tetragrammaton to get Jehovah. Born again Christians. Among mainstream Christians the most active in missionary work are the charismatic groups commonly known as born again Christians emphasize the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Stress is laid on reading the Bible. They consider mainstream Christians as not true Christians because they are not born of the Holy Spirit. First appeared among Protestants in 1960 and among Roman Catholics in 1966. Origins in Pentecostalism, 1901 John Wesley and John Fletcher, in which baptism in the Holy Spirit was stressed and glossalia, speaking in tongues, was practiced. 
approved by Pope Paul VI in 1973. Consequently, one should be familiar with whom one is inviting to Islam. The Unifying Belief, Trinity The unifying belief of mainstream Christianity is the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son and God the Holy Ghost Spirit, three gods in one. It is officially called the Nicene Creed and was agreed upon in a meeting of bishops in Nicaea which took place in 325 CE. Bishops, like Arius and others who supported Unitarianism and opposed the Trinitarian concept and the divinity of Jesus, were subsequently declared heretics, their followers hunted down, tortured and burned at the stake, and their gospels burned. The Bible Most Christians have not read the Bible, many have read small parts, most have only heard sections or verses mentioned in church sermons. Their belief in Christian theology is most often very weak. Oftentimes they have their own interpretations, thus it is best to find out the status of their beliefs prior to beginning discussion, if possible. The basic concept of Christianity, God bore a son who was himself and he allowed himself to be sacrificed to himself to free humankind of their sins. A simple approach. Logic, A equals B, B to C, therefore A equals C. Ask the Christian, could you ever become God? He should reply, no, because I am a human being. Ask the Christian, was Jesus a human being? He should reply, yes. Inform the Christian, therefore, he could never be God. The baby God. Christian insists that Jesus was the Son of God, but that he and God are one and the same. Inform the Christian, cows have calves, little cows. Cats have kittens, little cats. Humans have children, little humans. When God has a son, what is he? A little God. If so, you have two gods. For Catholics, most Filipinos, who say, Jesus was the Son of God and not God. Ask the Catholic, don't you say, Holy Mary Mother of God in your novena? He should reply, yes. Ask the Catholic, if Mary was the Mother of God, what was her son but a God? Ask the Catholic, where is Mary referred to as Mother of God in the New Testament? Ask the Catholic, can God have a mother? Distinguish between Jesus and God. Ask the Christian, when Jesus prayed, to whom did he pray? himself. Ask the Christian, when Jesus was resurrected, according to your beliefs, where is he now? Sitting on the right hand of God. If so, how could he be God? If God is able to do anything, he could become a man and have a son. Logically speaking, the answer is no because the concept of God becoming man contradicts the basic meaning of the term God. People commonly say that God is able to do all things. Whatever he wants to do, he can do. In the Bible of Christians it is said, through God all things are possible, Matthew 19.26. Mark 10.27, 14.36. The Qur'an of Muslim states, indeed, Allah, God, is able to do all things, Qur'an, 2.20, and the Hindu scriptures carry texts of similar meanings. All the major religious texts contain general expressions regarding the basic concept of God's omnipotence. He is greater than all things and through him all things are possible. If this general concept is to be translated into practical terms, one has to first identify and understand the basic attributes of God. Most societies perceive God as an eternal being without beginning or end. If, on the basis that God is able to do all things and it were asked whether God could die, what would be the answer? Since dying is part of all things, can it be said, if he wants to? Of course this cannot be said. So, there is a problem here. God is defined as being ever-living, without end, and dying means coming to an end. Consequently, to ask if he can die is actually a nonsensical question. It is self-contradictory. Similarly, to ask whether God can be born is also absurd because God has already been defined as eternal, having no beginning. Being born means having a beginning, coming into existence after not existing. In this same vein, atheist philosophers enjoy asking theists, can God create a stone too heavy for him to lift? If the theist says yes, it means that God can create something greater than himself. And if he says no, it means that God is unable to do all things. Therefore, the term all things in the phrase, God is able to do all things, excludes the absurdities. It cannot include things that contradict his divine attributes, things that would make him less than God, like, forgetting, sleeping, repenting, growing eating, etc. Instead, it includes only all things that are consistent with him being God. This is what the statement, God is able to do all things, means. It cannot be understood in the absolute sense, it must be qualified. The claim that God became man is also an absurdity. 
It is not befitting of God to take on human characteristics because it means that the Creator has become His creation. However, the creation is a product of the creative act of the Creator. If the Creator became His creation, it would mean that the Creator created Himself, which is an obvious absurdity. To be created, He would first have to not exist, and if He did not exist, how could He then create? Furthermore, if He were created, it would mean that He had a beginning, which also contradicts His being eternal. By definition creation is in need of a Creator. For created beings to exist they must have a Creator to bring them into existence. God cannot need a Creator because God is the Creator. Thus, there is an obvious contradiction in terms. The claim that God became His creation implies that He would need a Creator, which is a ludicrous concept. It contradicts the fundamental concept of God being uncreated, needing no Creator, and being the Creator. Jesus' Miracles Many Christians are under the impression that Jesus' miracles were unique to Himself and thus constitute evidence for His divinity. However, the majority of Jesus' miracles are recorded in the Old Testaments as having been done by earlier prophets. Jesus fed 5,000 people with five loaves of bread and two fishes. Jesus healed lepers. Jesus caused the blind to see. Jesus raised the dead. Jesus walked on water. Ella shaved 100 people with 20 barley loaves and a few ears of corn, 2 Kings 4.44. Elisha cured Naaman the leper, 2 Kings 5.14. Elisha caused the blind to see, 2 Kings 6, 17 and 20. Elijah did the same, raised the dead, 1 Kings 17, 22. So did Elisha, 2 Kings 4, 34. Even Elisha's bones could restore the dead, 2 Kings 13, 21. Moses and his people crossed the Dead Sea, Exodus 14, 22. Furthermore, there are also texts in the New Testament which confirm that Jesus did not act on his own. Jesus is quoted in John 5.30 as saying, I can of mine own self do nothing, and in Luke 11. 20 as saying, But if I with the finger of God cast out devils, no doubt the kingdom of God is come upon you. In Acts 2.22, Paul writes, Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know. Jesus the Son of God. Another of the evidences used for Jesus' divinity is the application of the title, Son of God, to Jesus. It should first be noted that nowhere in the Gospels does Jesus actually call himself, Son of God. In the New Testament book of Acts, there are several outlines of speeches of the early disciples of Jesus, speeches which date from the year 33 CE. Almost 40 years before the four Gospels were written. In one of these discourses, Jesus is referred to specifically as Andra Apo Tu Theo, a man from God. Acts 2.22 not once do these early confessions of faith use the expression why is Theo, son of God, but they do speak several times of Jesus as God's servant and prophet, Acts 3.13, 22, 23, 26. The significance of these speeches is that they accurately reflect the original belief and terminology of the disciples. before the belief and terminology were evolved under the influence of Roman religion and Greek philosophy. They reflect a tradition which is older than that used by the four Gospels in which Jesus is not invested with Godship or Divine Sonship. Bible Studies from a Muslim Perspective, p. 12. Instead, he is recorded to have repeatedly called himself, Son of Man, e.g. Luke 9.22, innumerable times. And in Luke 4.41, he actually rejected being called, Son of God. And demons also came out of many, crying, You are the Son of God. But he rebuked them and would not allow them to speak, because they knew that he was the Christ. However, there are numerous places in the Old Testament where this title has been given to others. God called Israel, Prophet Jacob, his son, when he instructed Prophet Moses to go to Pharaoh in Exodus 4. 22-23, 22 and you shall say to Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, Israel is my firstborn son, 23 and I say to you, Let my son go that he may serve me. See also, Hosea 1.10 of the King James Version. In 2 Samuel 8,13-14, God calls prophet Solomon his son, 13 he is Solomon, shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. 14 I will be his father, and he shall be my son. God promises to make prophet David his son in Psalms 89. 26 to 27, 26 he shall cry unto me, Thou art my father, my God, and the rock of my salvation, 27 also I will make him my firstborn, higher than the kings of the earth.
In the Revised Standard Version, it states, And I will make him the firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. See also Jeremiah 31. 9. For I am a father to Israel, and Ephraim is my firstborn. Angels are referred to as sons of God in the book of Job 1 6. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. See also, Job 2 1 and 38 4 7. Other references to sons of God can also be found in Genesis 6 2, Deuteronomy 14 1, and Hosea 1 10. In the New Testament, there are many references to sons of God other than Jesus. For example, when the author of the Gospel according to Luke listed Jesus' ancestors back to Adam, he wrote, the son of Ennis, the son of Seth, the son of Adam, the son of God. Luke 3.38 Some claim that what is unique in the case of Jesus is that he is the only begotten son of God, while the others are merely sons of God. The term begotten in Old English meant to be fathered by and it was used to distinguish between Jesus, who was supposed to be the literal son of God. From the figurative use of the term son of four gods created sons. However, God is recorded as saying to prophet David in Psalms 2 7, I will tell the decree of the Lord, he said to me, You are my son, today I have begotten you. The way of Jesus. An alternative approach is to question Christians about the degree to which they actually follow Jesus Christ. Prophets brought divine laws or confirmed those brought by previous prophets and invited people to worship God by obeying the divinely revealed laws. They also practically demonstrated for their followers how one should live by the law. Consequently, they also invited those who believed in them to follow their way as the correct way to come close to God. This principle is enshrined in the Gospel according to John 14 6, Jesus said to him, I am the way, and the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father, but by me. Although those who worship Jesus commonly quote this verse as part of the evidence for his divinity. Jesus did not invite people to worship himself instead of God, or as God. If these words were actually spoken by Jesus, what they mean is that one cannot worship God except in the way defined by the prophets of God. Jesus emphasized to his disciples that they could only worship God by the way which he had taught them. In the Quran, chapter Al Imran, 331. In the Qur'an, chapter Al Imran, 331. God instructs Prophet Muhammad, may Allah's peace and blessings be upon him, to instruct mankind to follow him if they truly love God. Tell the people, if you really love Allah, then follow me and Allah will love you and forgive your sins, for Allah is oft forgiving. Most merciful. The way of the prophets is the only way to God, because it was prescribed by God himself and the purpose of the prophets was to convey Allah's instructions to mankind. Without prophets, people would not know how to worship Allah. Consequently, all prophets informed their followers of how to worship God. Conversely, adding anything to the religion brought by the prophets is incorrect. Any changes made to the religion after the time of the prophets represents deviation inspired by Satan. In this regard, Prophet Muhammad, may Allah's peace and blessings be upon him, was reported to have said, whoever adds anything new to the religion of Islam, Bid'ah, will have it rejected by God. Sahih al-Bukhari, Vol. 3, p. 535, No. 861, and Sahih Muslim, Vol. 3, p. 931, No. 4266. Furthermore, anyone who worshipped Allah contrary to Jesus' instructions would have worshipped in vain. First and foremost, it must be realized that Jesus Christ, the son of Mary, was the last in the line of Jewish prophets. He lived according to the Torah, the law of Moses, and taught his followers to do likewise. In Matthew 5, 17-18, Jesus stated, 17 Think not that I have come to abolish the law and the way of the prophets, I have come not to abolish them but to fulfill them. 18 4, I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Unfortunately, about five years after the end of Jesus' ministry, a young rabbi by the name of Saul of Tarsus, who claimed to have seen Jesus in a vision, began to change Jesus' way. Paul, his Roman name, had considerable respect for Roman philosophy and he spoke proudly of his own Roman citizenship. His conviction was that non-Jews who became Christians should not be burdened with the Torah in any respect. The author of Acts 13.39 quotes Paul as saying, And by him everyone that believes is freed from everything from which he could not be freed by the law of Moses. 
It was primarily through the efforts of Paul that the church began to take on its non-Jewish character. Paul, he was beheaded in Rome 34 years after the end of Jesus' ministry, wrote most of the New Testament letters, epistles, which the church accepts as the official doctrine and inspired scripture. These letters do not preserve the gospel of Jesus or even represent it. Biblical studies from a Muslim perspective, p. 18, instead, Paul transformed the teachings of Christ into a Hellenic, Greco-Roman, philosophy. The following are some examples of teachings which Prophet Jesus followed and taught, but which were later abandoned by the church. However, most of these teachings were revived in the final message of Islam brought by Prophet Muhammad, may Allah's peace and blessings be upon him, and remain a fundamental part of Muslim religious practices until today. Circumcision Jesus was circumcised. According to the Old Testament, this tradition began with Prophet Abraham, who was himself neither a Jew nor a Christian. In Genesis 17.10, it is written, 9 And God said to Abraham, As for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your descendants after you throughout their generations. 10 This is my covenant, which you shall keep, between me and you and your descendants after you, every male among you shall be circumcised. 11 You shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. 12 He that is eight days old among you shall be circumcised. Every male throughout your generations, whether born in your house, or bought with your money from any foreigner who is not of your offspring. 13 Both he that is born in your house and he that is bought with your money, shall be circumcised. So shall my covenant be in your flesh an everlasting covenant. In the Gospel according to Luke 2.21 And at the end of eight days, when he was circumcised, he was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. Consequently, to be circumcised was a part of Jesus' way. However, today most Christians are not circumcised because of a rationale introduced by Paul. He claimed that circumcision was the circumcision of the heart. In his letter to the Romans 2.29, he wrote, He is a Jew who is one inwardly, and real circumcision is a matter of the heart, spiritual and not literal. In his letter to the Galatians 5.2, he wrote, Now I, Paul, say to you that if you receive circumcision, Christ will be of no advantage to you. See also Galatians 6.15. This was Paul's false interpretation. On the other hand, Jesus was not circumcised by the heart nor did he say anything about circumcision of the heart, he kept the everlasting covenant and was circumcised in the flesh. Thus, an important part of following the way of Jesus is circumcision. Pork. Jesus did not eat pork. He followed the laws of Moses and he did not eat pork. In Leviticus 11, 7 8, 7 and the swine, because it parts the hoof and is cloven footed but does not chew the cud, is unclean to you. 8 If their flesh you shall not eat, and their carcasses you shall not touch, they are unclean to you. See also, Deuteronomy 14, 8. Jesus only dealing with pigs was his permission to the unclean spirits which were possessing a man to enter them. When they entered the herd of pigs, they ran into the water and drowned. However, most people who call themselves Christians today not only eat pork. They love it so much that they have made pigs the subject of nursery rhymes e.g. This little piggy went to market, and children's stories, for example. The Three Little Pigs Porky Pig is a very popular cartoon character, and recently a full-length feature movie was made about a pig called Babe. Thus, it may be said that those who call themselves followers of Christ are not in fact following the way of Christ. In Islamic law, the prohibition of pork and its products has been strictly maintained from the time of Prophet Muhammad, may Allah's peace and blessings be upon him, until today. Jesus and his early followers observed the proper method of slaughter by mentioning God's name and cutting the jugular veins of the animals while they were living to allow the heart to pump out the blood. However, Christians today do not attach much importance to proper slaughter methods, as prescribed by God. Alcohol Jesus consecrated himself to God and therefore abstained from alcoholic drinks according to the instructions recorded in Numbers 6 1 4. And the Lord said to Moses, To say to the people of Israel, when either a man or a woman makes a special vow, the vow of the Nazarite, that is one separated or one consecrated, to separate himself to the Lord, three he shall separate himself from wine and strong drink. He shall drink no vinegar made from wine or strong drink, and shall not drink any juice of grapes or eat grapes, fresh or dried. For all the days of his separation he shall eat nothing that is produced by the grapevine, not even the seeds or the skins. As to the miracle of turning water into wine, comma, John 2, 1-11, it is found only in the Gospel of John, which consistently contradicts the other three Gospels. 
As mentioned earlier, the Gospel of John was opposed as heretical in the early church, the five Gospels. P. 20. While the other three Gospels were referred to as the Synoptic Gospels because the texts contained a similar treatment of Jesus' life, the New Encyclopedia Britannica, Vol. 5. P. 379. Consequently, New Testament scholars have expressed doubt about the authenticity of this incident. Ablution before prayer. Prior to making formal prayer, Jesus used to wash his limbs according to the teachings of the Torah. Moses and Aaron are recorded as doing the same in Exodus 40. 30 to 31, 30 and he set the lava between the tent of meeting and the altar and put water in it for washing. Thirty-one with which Moses and Aaron and his sons washed their hands and their feet. As the Lord commanded Moses. Prostration in prayer. Jesus is described in the Gospels as prostrating during prayer. In Matthew 26, 39, the author describes an incident which took place when Jesus went with his disciples to Gethsemane. And going a little farther he fell on his face and prayed, My father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me, nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. Christians today kneel down, clasping their hands in a posture which cannot be ascribed to Jesus. The method of prostration in prayer followed by Jesus was not of his own making. It was the mode of prayer of the prophets before him. In the Old Testament, Genesis 17:3, prophet Abraham is recorded to have fallen on his face in prayer. In Numbers 16:22 and 26, both Moses and Aaron are recorded to have fallen on their faces in worship. In Joshua 5:14 and 7:6, Joshua fell on his face to the earth and their faces in worship. In Joshua 5:14 and 7:6, Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshipped. In I Kings 18:42, Elijah bowed down on the ground and put his face between his knees. This was the way of the prophets through whom God chose to convey his word to the world. And it is only by this way that those who claim to follow Jesus will gain the salvation which he preached in his gospel. Veiling The women around Jesus veiled themselves according to the practice of the women around the earlier prophets. Their garments were loose and covered their bodies completely, and they wore scarves which covered their hair. In Genesis 24, 64-65, And Rebekah lifted up her eyes, and when she saw Isaac, she alighted from the camel, 65, and said to the servant, Who is the man yonder, walking in the field to meet us? The servant said, It is my master. So she took her veil and covered herself. Paul wrote in his first letter to the Corinthians, 5. But any woman who prays or prophesies with her head unveiled dishonors her head it is the same as if her head were shaven. 6. For if a woman will not veil herself, then she should cut off her hair. But if it is disgraceful for a woman to be shorn or shaven, let her wear a veil. Some may argue that it was the general custom of those times to be completely veiled. However, that is not the case. In both Rome and Greece, whose cultures dominated the region, the popular dress was quite short and revealed the arms, legs and chest. Only religious women in Palestine, following Jewish tradition, covered themselves modestly. According to Rabbi Dr. Menahem M. Breyer, professor of biblical literature at Yeshiva University, it was customary that Jewish women went out in public with a head covering which, sometimes, even covered the whole face, leaving only one eye free. The Jewish Woman in Rabbinic Literature, p. 239. He further stated that, during the Tanaitic period, the Jewish woman's failure to cover her head was considered an affront to her modesty. When her head was uncovered she might be fined 400 zuzim for this offense. Ibad, p. 139. The famous early Christian theologian, St. Tertullian, d. 220 CE, in his famous treatise, On the Veiling of Virgins, wrote, Young women, you wear your veils out on the streets, so you should wear them in the church. You wear them when you are among strangers, then wear them among your brothers. Among the canon laws of the Catholic Church until today. There is a law that requires women to cover their heads in church. Clara M. Henning, Canon Law and the Battle of the Sexes in Religion and Sexism, p. 272. Christian denominations, such as the Amish and the Mennonites for example, keep their women veiled to the present day. In chapter Al-Azab, 3359, the reason for veiling is given. Allah states that it makes the believing women known in the society and provides protection for them from possible social harm. O Prophet! Say to your wives and your daughters and the wives of the believers. Let your outer garments you wear hang loosely over you so that your bodies are not revealed to unrelated men. That is more likely to distinguish them as free women so that they are not subject to harassment like the servant girls are. And Allah forgiving of the sins of whichever of his servants repents, and he is merciful to them. Al-Azab, 3359.
Greetings. Jesus greeted his followers by saying, Peace be upon you. In chapter 2019, the anonymous author of the Gospel according to John wrote the following about Jesus after his supposed crucifixion, Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I send you. This greeting was according to that of the prophets, as mentioned in the books of the Old Testament. For example, in 1 Samuel 25, 6, Prophet David instructed emissaries whom he sent to Nabal, and thus you shall salute him. Peace be to you, and peace be to your house, and peace be to all that you have. The Qur'an instructs all who enter homes to give greetings of peace said Smiley chapter and Noah, 24, 27. O those who have faith in Allah and act on his sacred law, do not enter houses besides your own houses until you seek permission from their inhabitants to enter them and you greet them. By saying in greeting and seeking permission, Peace be on you, can I come in? That seeking permission you have been ordered is better for you than entering suddenly, so that you remember what you have been ordered and then carry it out. And those entering paradise will be greeted similarly by the angels. Chapter al 746 Between these two groups, the companions of paradise and the companions of hell, is a partition called al meaning the heights. On this partition are people whose good and bad actions are equal. They know the companions of paradise by their signs, such as the light on their faces, and the companions of hell by their signs, such as the darkness on their faces. These people of the partition call the companions of paradise, honoring them, saying, Peace be upon you. They do not enter paradise yet, but they hope to enter it through Allah's mercy. Whenever Muslims meet each other, they use this greeting. Salam alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu, peace be upon you and the mercy of Allah and his blessings.